for your website CMS implementation. Uh, my name is John Nan, uh, and with me is Tom Boone. And we are going to talk a bit about our experiences and some of the lessons that we learned. Um, most of them valuable, not all of them very easy to, to experience, but uh, hopefully you can learn from our experience. I just want to say that uh, by and large, our experience was fairly negative. Um, <laughs> so we're coming from a very particular point of view on this. And so uh, we encourage questions or people challenging us on some of the assumptions that we have uh, as we go through this. Because like I said, uh, we have a bit of a bad taste in our mouth. And it's, prob it's primarily because of the specific contractor that we worked with and how things uh, shook out with, uh, with that particular company. Um, but we. Hopefully, will not come off as negative towards the entire experience, but there is going to be that slight bias. There, there, is, there was a lot of value in it, and um, I'll talk a little bit about the background and, and the situation that you can get a little context. And you'll see that uh, the law school actually had a very good experience with the very contractor that we had a very bad experience with. So um, one, of the, one of the lessons, I guess, is it's really very uh, individual. Um, when you're dealing with these things. But let me, let me give you a little bit of the context. Um, we had a pretty nice, we thought, website. Um, it worked. Uh, it had been around for a while. Um, one of the things that was kind of surprising to me is I, when we were revisiting building our website, I sent around a, a post asking for recommendations of law library websites that we should look at when we were building ours. And a couple of people wrote us back and said, well, yours. So I said, okay, you know, we, we're doing some things okay, and we can, we can make things better. So we were considering updating our site, and I'm going to not move near that microphone. Um, and one of the things that really pushed us to it is that the, the law school redid their site. The law, the law school hired um, a design team. They bought a CMS and uh, updated their site. And so we were having a kind of an older, more static looking site next to their uh, more vital, more modern site. So we decided that we needed to, to do some work. And we <coughs> pretty quickly. Um, I just want to cut you off real quick. Please. To be rude. Um, do it. To give you an idea of, of how things were being done uh, before 
uh, we switched to a content management system. Uh, we, it was all static HTML with uh, a few forms that were based on ASP scripts scattered through the site. Um, but everything was edited in Dreamweaver, um, mostly by individual librarians and to some extent a few staff members here and there. Uh, but it was, it, like I said, it was all static HTML, nothing was database driven, and um, everybody had to work within Dreamweaver to make anything, uh, to update anything on the site. Right. Which made it um, fairly difficult to have a lot of the end users doing the updating that we, we had wanted them to do. Uh, for example, our circulation department had a lot of different information that they would keep wanting to put on the website and change and update, but they didn't feel that they had the technological skills. So we were looking at, at going with CMS for probably the same reasons most people are. We wanted to distribute the, the work, making it an easier place, an easier thing for people to update. Uh, we wanted to update the look and feel, um, and we wanted to uh, improve our content, our organization, our relationship with the law school's site. Um, so those were some of the things that we were looking at. Uh, we, one of the things that we really didn't do is start at the very beginning and pick the best CMS for us. And the reason we didn't do that was that the law school had bought a CMS. They installed it on the, on the servers. The IT department had gone and, and learned a bit about how to use the CMS. Um, we were trying to be good corporate citizens and do, do sort of what they, what they were doing. Um, I think that if we had had complete freedom to do what we want, we probably would have gone with a different CMS. Um, but our CMS, it's, it's red dot, it works. It's <laughs> <We're calling laughs> names. Oh, that's right, sorry. <laughs> Why, why would you have gone with it? I mean, what was it, lacking or what happened? What is it about your current CMS that Well, sort of there's, not, there's not much support isn't great. There's not much documentation. Um, it's expensive. And I'll, and I'll be talking about all of these things in great detail. Yeah, but, but it's, it's, got, it's got a, little, a couple of kinks with it. So we decided that we wanted to go to a CMS. We, wanted to work with the IT department, and that's really what they were, were wanting us to, to go with. We uh, also had a lot going on at the time, and very early on in our project, our probably our top technology librarian uh, left, got, went on for a better, bigger and better job. Tom was not with us at the time. So we also outsourced the not only the design work, but the implementation. And we were, we were hiring a contractor to really give us a turnkey site. Um, and we also went with the same vendor that the law school had gone with when they moved their site over. They had had a wonderful experience with this vendor and had you know, wonderful things to say about them. Uh, so we also followed along, along with that. We had um, sort of an artificial time constraint. My boss wanted it done at the end of the uh, academic year, so we have the summer to really play with it before the students came back. This was what? This was the fall. This was the fall of uh, like well, two years ago now. Yeah. yeah, two years ago now is when we were starting this. He wanted it to be done about a year ago. So we met with our, our contractors. We uh, laid out what we wanted. We recommended places for them to look at. They fairly quickly came back with. Um, designs, art designs, and, and I think, and we all seem to agree, that they did a really good job with the, the look and feel and the designs of the, the site, and then we, we turned over to them the construction of the site. Uh, and this is where we started to run into some <laughs> problems. <coughs> Our vendors were not the most responsive people in the world, um, and that's being very, very kind to them. Um, we would call them roughly once a week, remind them what our deadlines were, get assured that they would definitely meet the deadlines. Our project wasn't that big. Our site's not that big. Our project wasn't that big. So this was all, you know, a year and a half ago in the winter, in the spring, in June, and we were supposed to come up June 15th, 
and we really hadn't seen anything from them. So you would see wireframes, basically right. seen about four or five wireframes that showed the design of the site, uh, what it would look like once it was implemented, but there was no implementation at that point. Right. So we continue to get assured we'd be here, we'd get it up by August. Tom started in August. Um, at this point, my boss called the owner of the company and suggested some uh, problems with the, the way that this was going and uh, received assurances that we would get a, a good response. And we did for about two or three weeks. If, um, uh, yeah. We started to get a lot of response from the uh, team leader. Um, but fairly quickly, uh, the communication fell off again. Right. And at this point, most of the communication was going on through um, conference calls. Uh, we had a uh, committee um, in the library of about four of us, uh, five if you count Blair, the library director, and um, we tried to communicate with them uh, mainly through those conference calls, which usually took several days to schedule uh, in order to get responses from everyone when they were available. And they would get canceled the day before. We canceled the day before and rescheduled. Um, and so, and then, so essentially, once once the uh, uh, effect of uh, the phone call to the owner of the company uh, wore off, we were back to square one, and we pretty much al already fired the big gun. Yeah. Um, and that that will, we'll talk a bit about our lessons, and that's probably our number one lesson out of this this whole thing is uh, to have have the guns. Uh, let me talk. Uh, so finally, the site did go up. The site went up about six months late. Um, we are fairly pleased with the site. We found a couple of functions that we had to move outside of the site. Um, and there are some other issues with the CMS that we chose to go with that um, we're still working on and still working with, and IT is still working on and still working with. But we feel that. Uh, CMS was definitely the, the right way to go. Uh, <laughs> we are getting people able to, to maintain their own parts of the site. The CMS that we went with was pretty good. Could have done better, but it, it was pretty good. Uh, the real issues that came up, though, were contractor relations and personnel issues. And one of the things that I think was the hardest for, for Tom was he was just starting at the library. And as you might expect, we were a little frustrated with the whole project. Um, and he was stepping into a really hard situation where there was a lot of tension and frustration from everybody in the library about this site. And, and Tom kind of got in the, in the line of fire on a fair bit of it. Um, and one of the things that I think really turned around Tom's position vis-a-vis -vis the library was when he was really good at constant communication with the library even if there was nothing to tell us. Mm -hmm. Just knowing that you know, somebody is, is, is trying to hold their feet to the fire really turned around a lot, at least in, internally turned around the situation. The one thing that we found is that we really didn't have any power over this company. Um, we had a contract with them. Um, we didn't have any drop dead dates in the contract. We didn't have any uh, liquidated damages in the contract. We didn't have anything in the contract that we could uh, threaten them. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> that's exactly how we felt. <laughs> you know? um, and it was really this, this uh, not this, this power differential was, I think, the main issue that I would take out of this. And whatever I would do, I would ensure that you write a contract that gives you power throughout the process. And we, we ceded far too much power to them. Um, one of the things that I, I had, one of the mistakes I had made early on was I was not aggressive enough with, with this company. And when things were sp you know, spun further and further away, um, I'm not sure I could have done it anymore. When I was contacting them several times a week and not getting responses, uh, the only gun we had was, again, Blair talking to the boss. That helped a little bit, but once that was gone. Um, one of the things that, that I had to take a lot out of it is managing this process was being really cognizant of Tom's position. And 
really being a buffer between the library, the expectations of the people, and, and Tom. Because um, Tom was doing really hard work in real frustrating circumstances. And people were, were you know, obviously we're six months late. Let's get this up. Let's get this working. What's going on? So um, in the end, though, we have a website up. We're ready to move on and do some good things with the site. And Tom's already done a couple of really nice workarounds that he'll show you in a second. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Tom to talk a little bit about his perspective on the development of the project and the issues. Yeah, we can talk more about, rather than just sort of the, the overview, some of the more specific issues that we encountered uh, during the process. Um, and the very first thing um, was not necessarily related to the contractor specifically, but with the choice of the CMS. And um, as John said, we went with what the law school was already using. It was what the IT department in the law school was prepared to support for us. Uh, there wasn't um, much else offered to us in the way of what, what uh, would be available for active support from the IT staff. We don't have, yeah. So just to clarify, you're, you don't have an IT department within the library that could help no. you do this, so this was all for you. Right. Basically, um, the way the structure works is the law school itself has a fairly large IT department, um, and they're not doing much in the way of open source. Everything is primarily uh, proprietary. A lot of Microsoft, all of our servers are Windows servers. Um, so they have a staff that is geared towards a certain direction with things. And without having our own IT staff within the library, basically the, like the ILS, the OPAC, that's maintained by tech services. Uh, the website and the other web services is what I maintain. And that's the extent of the expertise in the library. And I'm not an IT professional. Uh, I'm a librarian. And what I knew coming into this job was primarily uh, open source software. I came from a library that had quite a bit less money than uh, Yale did. And so the tools that we were using to um, uh, work on the web uh, were primarily open source. Uh, mainly had been working quite a bit with uh, Drupal, but uh, that was not really an option that we had available to us um, at Yale. And so with this CMS that we sort of inherited from the law school, it is um, very expensive. There's not a lot of documentation out there for it unless you attend the company's training sessions, which are extremely expensive. And then when you arrive at the training session, and the, uh, the closest one to us would be in New York, um, you are handed a piece of documentation that is far superior to anything that you can access from the company's website, even within the password protected section of the website that's designed for customers. I attended a two-day training session that gave me a pretty decent piece of documentation. Uh, there's another training session that lasts five days that I have not attended that is extremely expensive, uh, would require you know, a hotel for a week in addition to um, the uh, price of the training itself. And um, that would be even better documentation. I think that one of our IT staff has attended that session, and I've been begging for that documentation, and she hasn't been able to track it down. Um, she also telecommutes. So she spends most of her time in New Jersey um, and comes up to the law school once a week. So that, that's another little wrinkle in that, in that part of it. Um, something else about the content management system is that the scripting language that it supports best is its own proprietary scripting language. Uh, you, can, you can use ASP scripting uh, within it, but if you really want the full power of this CMS that costs thousands upon thousands of dollars, you need someone who can write in that query language. Nobody in-house at the law school knows that query language. Uh, when I was having a conversation with uh, a member of the IT staff where I was basically uh, asking to use some open source tools that I knew quite a bit better to accomplish a few things. The response that I got was, well, you should learn, I'll go ahead and say it, red dot query language. Because if you learn that, then you're making an investment in Yale, 
and people all over this law school will be, will be knocking on your door. It's not uh, like Tom has anything else to do. Yeah, to, to have you do all kinds of things for the law school's website, uh, not just the libraries. And like I said, I'm not an IT professional. I'm a librarian. I have reference desk hours. I have faculty asking me questions. I have, I have plenty to do without having to take on the uh, web development for the entire law school. Um, and I don't know if she has yet, but I was told that the, the person in-house who is uh, the most knowledgeable about Red Dot is planning to learn the query language, but so far everything that is, is being scripted within the, within the uh, content management system is still being done through ASP, which it being a Microsoft shop, that's what everybody uh, in IT knows. Yeah? Good question. Well, I think that there, there is there's a strong tendency towards proprietary versus open source, and the rationale, not that I'm making a value judgment on this rationale, but the rationale is that with a proprietary commercial solution, you get a company behind you that you can call for support. Um, that doesn't necessarily answer why Red Dot versus another. And I I wasn't at any of the the meeting. By the time I got involved and, and saw the the law school's project, they'd already selected the CMS, so I'm not sure how they how they picked that. I, I know Red Dot was approaching us hard. I'll hint you. They, they do a great presentation. And we bought, Suffolk bought it. I think Red Dot does a knockout, bang out presentation. When there's Good salesman. <laughs> yeah, I think they do a great job that way. Yeah, yeah Josh. Uh, I'll add, there's some um, slide sets and several conferences that I've been to that show the progression of how you build a failed web project. And it starts with the consultant that comes in and gives you a presentation about whatever particular package their vendor's for. And that's the first step down this thing that looks like this great project plan that ends up in a flaming ball of stuff that's going to You just uh, mentioned that uh, they gave a, like a five-day wonderful uh, training session. Have you ever asked them to just send that for a cost, like the material? No, and that's probably something that needs to happen. I bet they wouldn't do it. I bet they wouldn't either. Yeah, and, and <laughs> I think, that, I think that, that's probably that's an assumption that I've always made, which is why I haven't actually made the phone call, which I should do. But yeah. would they come up? I mean, I don't know if this is relevant to you, but if there are enough people, even on your campus, not just in the library at the law school, that need to learn this language, would they come up and do? A training session, like a work two day workshop. They probably would. You can put them up at Yale, and, and we did that. We've done that with Innovative, <laughs> you know, just sort of yeah. the the rest of the university has. Well, the university library has not yet selected what way they're going, so and I assume that they're not. Well, the <laughs> the, um, the at Yale, there's not much unification between different schools as to what they use. Uh, I know that the School of Architecture is using Drupal for its site. Uh, the medical school just opted to use uh, Tridian for its site. The medical school library, however, is using Drupal for its site. So even within the medical school, you've got a divide right there between, uh, between two different departments. And I know that um, when the medical school um, was making choices as to which CMS they would ultimately choose, they had 13 that they compared, and they were all commercial CMSs. They were, there were no open source options that they were even looking at. Um, Red Dot was one of their three finalists, and they opted against Red Dot because the back end was too complicated and was not user friendly for their users, which is something that we've encountered quite a bit. Um, as far as the contractor goes, problems that, uh, from, from my perspective as the, the quote-unquote technology expert in the library, was the necessity of getting training to the rest of the library staff uh, on how to use this system. And it was, it was difficult to schedule training, not just because of the communication problem, that was certainly part of it, but another problem with scheduling training from the contractor was that 
Because the launch date kept sliding, we had to determine when to do training, and when we ultimately did finally do training with the staff, thinking that we were close enough to the launch date uh, to bring everyone in, have them sit down, use the system. Um, well, it turned out we were still probably about four months away from launch. And so by the time we launched, you know, the people, the rest, the rest of the library staff, even the ones who are tech savvy, they're not using the system that they've never used before. They're not going to retain uh, the knowledge that they need to be able to use it. Um, and quite frankly, most of them have better things to do over the course of their days than to uh, play around with a website that's not even online yet. So there was the, there was the, the training problem. Um, in terms of the actual implementation from the contractor, we had some hiccups in terms of specific features on the site. There were features that we had asked for that as it got closer and closer to when we wanted to launch and then well past when we had wanted to launch, uh, there were features that just weren't there. That um, in some cases the, uh, the web developers had conveniently forgotten about doing. Um, there were, other, there were other features that, um, no matter how many times we explained them, the next time we would have a conversation with them, they would have reverted back to a misunderstanding about what exactly it is that they were trying to implement in a particular we'd, part of the site. We'd ask them to create a wrapper for our, our uh, integrated library system to make it look like it. Well, we still haven't implemented that because they never really understood and in, some, some, <laughs> and in some of those cases, which is the third type of problem with the missing features, there were certain things that we told them, don't worry about right now. We'll worry about this after we launch the main website. Don't work on this. One of those was getting the uh, online catalog for the library um, with the same look and feel as the rest of the website. And we told them over and over again, don't worry about that. Just focus on the main website. Next time we would have one of these number conference one calls, on the agenda. <laughs> number one on the agenda would be, okay, we've got questions about this uh, wrapper for the catalog. And so, okay, <laughs> stop it. Stop it. Stop working on that. That's uh, We've already told you over and over again. So we had a lot of these sort of miscommunications, misunderstandings that just kept this delay just growing and growing and snowballing to the, to the point where finally what we ended up launching was... Um, basically our old site in a CMS. We didn't really add any new functionality. Um, slightly reorganized, slightly... There, there was definitely a better organization to the site just by, uh, by the virtue of being in a content management system. It uh, gave the site more structure. It uh, made things a little easier to navigate to, although at the same time it sort of amplified places where the site was really way too deep and required too many clicks to get to something. Uh, it also amplified where we had redundant pages, some of which we still haven't had the opportunity to condense down to single pages. Um, and in terms of this idea of taking the old static site and converting it into a, um, a CMS, once we got the site launched, um, going into some of these pages to updating them and realizing that all that they had done in most cases was copy the HTML from the page on the old site, paste it in to the uh, text editor on the new site, and it didn't matter how bad the code was. Um, Notes were left inside the uh, code. Kind of the, our, our list of, uh, of research databases, legal databases, had notes that were left in the comments on, in the code from eight years ago where a subscription to a database had lapsed and rather than just delete out the, um, that entry in the, uh, in the page, they had commented it out and added a date to when it had been canceled. And all of those notes were still on that page, even in the, in the new system. So um, that, that was a bit of a headache trying to, I, I mean, I haven't had the opportunity to go in and clean all of that up, but, but making an effort to go in and get rid of all of that uh, bad coding that was, that was left there. But regardless of cleaning it up, because of the content management system we have, the text editor that comes with Red Dot 
produces HTML that is just about the least compliant HTML I've ever seen in my life. Um, it, it is hard to use. Just, just to give you an idea of how bad it is, all of the tags are in capital letters. And if you've been using HTML any time in the last, I don't know, eight, ten years, um, you know that that's, that's a big no-no. You're, you're not going to be compliant just on that alone. Um, lots of deprecated tags in there. I know that uh, Red Dot allows for um, a third-party text editor to be used in place of the one that comes with the system. And it's my understanding that before the library site went up, the law school was using, um, I believe they were using FCK editor um, with, the, with Red Dot. But there was a problem with it not, when they, up, when they upgraded to the newest version of Red Dot, that was no longer compatible with the latest version of FCK. So they reverted back to the, um, to the out of the box text editor with Red Dot, which is what we got when we launched our site. And there's been talk of, of finding an alternative to FCK, but nothing's happened as of yet. So um, in terms of valid HTML, uh, making sure you're compliant with ADA, that's just not been something we could even make possible with the system that we have right now. Um, and it's, I mean, to be quite honest, it's kind of embarrassing. Kind of. <laughs> so, um, the last thing I'll say about kind of the headaches that I had um, as the uh, technologist on uh, in-house on this was that this project was not good for morale. It was, the longer this went on, the more that people would grumble uh, within the library, and with good reason. And I think the more that people would look at me and wonder, what's, what's the new guy doing? I mean, what, what exactly is he doing every day? And the fact of the matter is, is that by the last uh, month or two of the project, what I was doing every day was sending out email after email after email to the contractors making phone call after phone call and talking to them multiple times a day, every single day, because that was the only way that the site was going to get done. And during the last week um, uh, before we actually launched, I was working about, I'd say, 15 to 16 hour days. And I was doing a lot of the work that the contractor should be doing. I was finding pages that were missing from the site, pages that should have been imported months before, before we actually got into any sort of testing phase, which of course we never got to any testing phase because basically as soon as we had a site that was ready for testing, we went live with it because it had been six months. And so uh, I, in order to get this thing online, I had to basically become another member of the, of the team of contractors. And truth be told, the, the problem with this was the, was the project manager on the end of the contractor. For whatever reason, he was uh, not responsive at all. Uh, we, would make, we would make requests, send specific um, uh, features that we wanted added, and we would get an acknowledgement that we had sent them, and then hear nothing for a week or two. And then next time we talked to them, oh yeah, we've almost got that done. And, and as I mentioned before, the law school had dealt with the same contractor and had a different project manager and had a far different experience. And they sung the praises of the, the contractor and of the project manager. And, and actually, um, as it turned out, anything that was related to Red Dot itself, the actual system, the back end, uh, the features that were built, that we were building in Red Dot, there was a subcontractor uh, that worked with the main contractor who handled all of the, uh, the, the really technical back end of the site. And once that distinction became clear, I was talking to him directly. Yeah, and once we found him, it got to him. And got he <laughs> was far more responsive, he was far more knowledgeable, and I would work with him again in a heartbeat if he wasn't working for that company. And <laughs> it, it, it's an arrangement where even though he's a subcontractor, he's a subcontractor that works for the contractor, uh, always. So, so really, it was just—I mean—it was one person in this in this chain that was 
making everything break. And as John noted, we still, it's been, we, we launched this site at the beginning of the semester, I think right after Martin Luther King Day. Mm -hmm. And um, we still don't have our library catalog switched to the new look and feel. And I haven't even heard any updates on that from Mary Jane. I know at one point that she had found someone, an, another separate consultant to hire to work on it because uh, they were, the, but basically, there just needed to be some CSS changes made to the style sheet for the catalog, and they weren't being made. And when they were made, uh, just to give you an example of the, the thought process going on with the contractor, he basically he sent me a lot of CSS that he said to add to the style sheet for the, what, the entire website and said that he would just have the catalog uh, read the style sheet from the main website. Well, the problem is he made changes to the CSS for you know things like body <laughs> and uh, anchor tags. So he made changes to the size and the color and the position of you know fairly top level tags that when I implemented them for the three minutes that I was willing to implement them. <laughs> Uh, our main website ended up with, uh, with text you couldn't read because he had shrunk down all of our text. It made the catalog look beautiful. <laughs> um, but it just didn't really help out much with the rest of the website. So I think that brings us to the lessons, yes. Lesson number one, choose your content management system first. And Of course, the first question is, can your school support the CMS that you, that, uh, that you want to use? And the answer that we had was that Red Dot was the one that our uh, IT department could support. And that's great. <laughs> but uh, obviously, from our experience, there's some other questions that you have to ask. Obviously, the idea of a CMS that uses its own proprietary language for scripting, whether or not you have someone who is able to script in that language, because if you don't, uh, you, you will end up in a situation where once you're handed the site from the contractor, that's the site you're going to have. You will be able to add and remove content, but you won't be able to add any new functionality to the site, really, because everything is based upon a scripting language that nobody in-house actually knows. Um, open source systems typically uh, will rely on uh, skills that uh, are more transferable, I guess would be the word to use. Uh, something that's built on PHP and MySQL is something that a librarian uh, coming in situation where a librarian running a website, which is a very common thing in law schools, uh, is not going to have this you know, wide portfolio of programming languages that they know. Um, and so if you get something that runs on PHP or something else that's just as popular, then the likelihood that you'll be able to hire a librarian uh, down the road to take over the website and hit the ground running increases greatly. Um, just as if you, um, if you choose a CMS that's based on uh, a language that maybe a libra your, your technology librarian doesn't know, uh, but it's something that would, they would be able to use in just about any job that they went to. There's a lot more incentive uh, for that person to actually learn that language as opposed to, in our case, a scripting language for an incredibly cost prohibitive content management system that unless you go to one of the uh, top universities in the country or to a large corporation uh, and likelihood of a law librarian at a university going to a uh, going to work for some large corporation is probably not that great. So uh, that that's not a skill that's then going to be incredibly transferable. Um, and on the issue of CMS and support, there there's a lot of uh, IT departments out there. I've, I've encountered this in a lot of different settings in the last year or so. Um, on different projects is that there's, there are a lot of IT departments that tend to think that because it's open source, that means that there's not going to be any support available for it. 
And that might be the case in some, uh, some open source systems, but in some of the more, um, more well-developed uh, systems, say Drupal, um, there are actually companies out there that you can hire to provide 24-7 support for, uh, for your Drupal installation just as if you had installed Red Dot and had a tech, you know, tech support line to call for, uh, for help with your system. And as somebody who sat in on two different calls to tech support uh, with Red Dot, I can't imagine that uh, the uh, support that you would get from, uh, from one of those open source providers would be much worse. Um, because what, what we found in our tech support calls was what you find in just about any tech support call, which is the line of questioning that they're going to use when they're talking to you is to make sure that they can't be blamed for the problem, is to make sure that they can close that case by saying it was user error. Yeah. What did you do to break it? Exactly. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is, with one of these particular cases in which uh, a librarian had been working on a page for about a week that was probably had about 200 links on it to different resources for one of our clinics. Um, it, technically speaking, it probably was user error. Um, but that does little to uh, make her feel any better, particularly when the person on the phone is telling her literally that it was user error. I mean, he used those words. And while I understand from, uh, you know, for paperwork point, you know, point of view that that's what they're going to check off on their, uh, on their resolution, that the problem was user error, but I don't think that's uh, the type of language that a... Um, Especially if it, it, it is technically user error, but it's user error because of the really poor it's, it's user language it's, used in the... Well, it's, it's, it's user <laughs> error because... Um, there was nothing to warn the user that a certain action was going to cause them to lose everything, or that that there wasn't a revision being saved every time they hit the save button, because <laughs> there literally is a save button at the bottom of the text editor. However, the only revisions that get saved uh, across sessions rather than within an individual session, the only revisions that get actually saved in the system are the ones that get pushed to the live site. And so when we went back to look at what revisions were available, we had one from five days earlier in which there was no content at all because um, someone had shown her how to publish a, that page when she wanted to publish it. Um, so uh, so th that's, that's my uh, rant on tech support from the uh, proprietary CMS system. Uh, so the next lesson would be only choose your contractor after you've selected your CMS. Um, primary reason being is that if you select your contractor first, then if your contractor knows a particular content management system, odds are that's what they're going to want to use. And that won't necessarily mean that it's the best system for you to use for your, uh, for your library or, or for your law school website. Um, you know, it could be that this person happens to you know, be a good friend of somebody within law school. They were recommended because they're good at what they do, but what they do might not be what's right for, uh, for your institution. Well, one of our big mistakes was, I think, was being going with a CMS that would, was okay and worked well and, and did what the law school wanted instead of really looking at what the library needed and how our needs were different and gone, gone that way. Not that I'm sure we could have gotten that approved, but we went with them instead of really saying, you know, what are our needs and make sure that the CMS met all of our needs. Right, I, I think that the lesson for both one and two, in terms of choosing both the content management system and choosing the contractor, uh, that was the same problem uh, with, with, the, with the Yale Library website, was that um, those, those steps were basically skipped uh, in the process because there was something already being handed over as a proposed solution. Skip. And, yeah. I was surprised uh, they gave you a different project manager. I was stunned. <laughs> and I asked for the other project manager, but they, he was unavailable. He was still working for the company? Yeah. And we talked to the owner of the company and to get him assigned, but he, they wouldn't. 
They didn't assign it. The guy that we had was just as good. <laughs> um, but I mean, basically the lesson here is to choose a contractor who specializes in the content management system that you've already selected. Um, in most cases, whether it's in, in commercial systems, the company will usually have a list of, of preferred um, developers that they work directly with. Of course, in our case, our contractor is on that list for Red Dot, so uh, that wouldn't have solved our problem. But, but even in open source systems, um, you can go on their website and there would usually be somewhere on the site a list of developers who specialize in that particular, um, in that particular system. We just needed a bigger cudgel, I think. Yeah. So the next lesson <laughs> is make your contractor accountable for delays. And this was a big problem that we had with our site was there was no incentive whatsoever for the web developers to meet our deadlines. Um, there was nothing in the contract that provided any sort of penalties for missing the deadlines. Um, there was basically, in terms of deadlines, all we really had was one deadline, which was we want the whole thing done by the end of the school year, then it changed to the end of the summer, then it changed to Christmas, and then it changed to <laughs> by the beginning of the academics, you know, the, the next semester. And so, but there, but there was no reason other than whether or not we were going to recommend them to somebody else, you know, in terms of just plain old goodwill, there was no reason for them to meet our deadlines. And by that point, we weren't going to recommend them to anybody anyway, so. Well, I, I would say that this contractor had, on the law school site, there was a very, very short time frame. And it, the, the dean wanted the site up, you know, X date, and they had like four or five months to go from, hey, let's redo the website to be live. And that was, you know, the dean's timing, and the contractor did a great job with them. Just, you know, got it. Did a great job, got it up, met the deadlines, it was done, it was perfect, the dean was happy. So we kind well, of figured they proved themselves. And, well, and, and I would say that there, there's a big difference in terms of pressure when it comes to whether or not you're getting pressured by the dean of Yale Law School or you're getting pressured by me. Yeah. There's a slight <laughs> difference. Was it a contractor that typically worked with um, higher education institutions or? Not necessarily, every yeah, if, if you look at their portfolio, there are a couple including Yale Law School, uh, on their list. Um, but that's not the primary focus. I have a question. Yeah. Did your dean know what was happening? Did Blair talk to him? I don't know if Blair talked to, to Harold. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I, mean, I think that from a certain, uh, to a certain extent, um, there were delays that I take on my own as my own responsibility because I came into the situation and was too timid because I just, you know, started at this job. I didn't want to rock any boats. I didn't want to come in and tell everybody how to do things. And it turns out that there was somebody I should have come in telling how to do things. Um, and I didn't do that until about four months into my job. A, a simple way of uh, making things better, that's what I do in my work carbon copy to your big mm -hmm. boss and the contractor's big boss. Yeah. So because then they cannot blame or we didn't know. Right. Because uh, at a certain point, maybe if you want to pull out of the contract, they'll say, oh, if you could have told us uh, two months uh, ago, you know, we would have fixed it. Yeah. But then you are not giving right. that excuse. Yeah. yeah. I think that's true. And I think that when Tom was CCing, especially my boss, um, on all of his communications, and I did eventually. Uh, I, I wasn't I wasn't ceasing the dean, but I was ceasing. Um, I, it wasn't so much that I was ceasing um, Blair on everything that everything that I sent to the contractor. I did some, but at the very least, every single day I was sending, I was forwarding messages to Blair so that he knew what was going on, and that that did a lot in terms of protecting myself, I guess would be the way to look at that. And in I think terms of him knowing that I was doing everything that I could right. and that and it was easier for him to see where the problem was. And I think that's when a lot of the, the kind of behind the scenes resentment started to ease off at that point when you know people around the library was realizing that Tom was busting his butt to try and get this up and nothing was you know, wasn't his fault. 
Yeah, and there's another, another um, note on uh, deadlines is that uh, I said we only had one deadline and we really needed to have certain phases of the project with distinct yeah. deadlines for each phase. And I think the lack of those intermediate deadlines caused a lot of the problems that we had in terms of uh, you know, bad code being imported in and features missing and pages missing that I had to go back because there was never a point anywhere earlier where all of those sorts of things were supposed to be finished and we could look at it and see whether they were finished. It, and everything get, get, kept getting pushed together as yeah. it stretched out. And, 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 so, and so by the end, we had design work working on top of content work, on top of uh, programming work. Everything was just overlapping, and all we wanted to do was get something online that worked. Yeah? Did you ever find out whether it was just a case of the squeaky wheel getting the grease and you were being put to the bottom and they were responding to other Clients right. Were putting more pressure yeah. on you? I, I don't. I don't know if that's the case, but I mean, but it, but the way I looked at it was, if um, if I was a contractor who had a client who had no deadlines, and I had other projects on my desk that had deadlines, I know which ones I'd be working on. Right. Um, and it wouldn't be the one that had no penalties for being late. Yeah. I, th I never found out what was really going on inside their organization and why no. this all happened. No, I mean we we. we we, we had all kinds of speculation about whether there were pills involved or food <laughs> involved. I mean, I have no idea. Okay. Yeah. What was the payment structure for the contract? Uh, I think it was uh, most on completion. And I will say that when we, when we yeah. got, I, I did actually see the invoice for the final payment, and um, there was a lot of money taken off of it because there was quite a bit of money that um, had been estimated for on-site testing and <laughs> so we basically once they had something that was done-ish we went live and we didn't do any sort of testing which is a problem we I mean we haven't done the kind of testing that you should be doing on this kind of project but they will get their money back by giving you that training <laughs> yeah. no not them so the next lesson would be that uh, you need to get some sort of documentation on the site uh, from the contractor. And this is two different kinds of documentation. Uh, the first kind would be um, user documentation for your actual content providers, people in-house who are going to be using the website. In a lot of cases, when you switch from static HTML that, that usually will all get funneled to one person maintaining the website, when you switch to CMS, you have lots of people who are not particularly tech savvy starting to use the website and provide content and actually uh, actually adding the content themselves. For the purpose. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so um, what we ended up with was uh, we had the one training session that was about four months before we launched that uh, nobody retained any, any uh, of the skills they learned. And then once the site launched, I did about three training sessions uh, with our staff as well as we did a spotlight series for the library staff uh, that just kind of did an overview of the site, showed them how everything worked, what was there. Uh, but that, that training fell upon, upon me to do in the end. And on top of that, what about people who um, couldn't make it to any of the training sessions? What about people that we hire tomorrow who weren't here when we went through this whole process? Um, what about people who use the system so infrequently that every time they need to add something new, they've completely forgotten how they, how they do it? There's, we didn't have any sort of documents available to them uh, to, to show them how to use the system. And in, in with a content management system, when it comes to that user end sort of thing, unless you're using an out-of-the-box uh, installation of the site, if you have any sort of specialized content types or anything added to the site, there is no company documentation coming from uh, the uh, the CMS provider uh, that, that tells users how to add content to the site. That's something that the contractor has built with the CMS and needs to provide documentation on how a user does that within your particular site. Then secondly, uh, there's also not really any technical documentation for the site in terms of how Red Dot and how different scripts were used to add certain functionality. So. Uh, for someone like me who really doesn't know um, how to use uh, ASP scripts, doesn't really know uh, the really you know, hardcore back-end um, red dot issues, 
um, I don't have any way of, of seeing, okay, this list of, um, of recent items that shows up on this page, I don't know how that was constructed in Red Dot. And there's no documentation from the contractor that says, here's how we did this. And so we're stuck in a very static sort of situation where we can add new content to that, to that area of the site, but we can't add any, any new functionality to it. And the last thing is, lesson number five is to become an active participant in the actual development project. Even though you have outsourced this to another company, you have to stay involved, not just from a point of view of sort of hounding the contractor and keeping the lines of communication open, but you need, need to actually be in there using the system because when all is said and done, at the end of the day, uh, that contractor's not gonna be there anymore and everybody's going to be coming to you. If, you. if you're the person who was the go-to person during the development, once the contractor's gone, you now become the expert on that site. And every question is going to start funneling towards you. So you need to be uh, asking questions throughout the entire process, not just about when is something going to get done, but how did you do this? Um, make sure that all the functionality you want is there and that you know uh, as best you can how it works. Um, also, you uh, need to actually be in, make sure that you have access to the back end of the site from the beginning so that all that, all that stuff is being built up. You can actually see it going from bare bones, out of the box CMS to whatever the functionality is at the end of the, the, uh, the cycle because that will, will offer you a first hand view of how all of this happened and then when there's nobody else to rely on, everybody's coming to you, you'll be able to deal with the questions and the requests that are coming to you. And also, just I already said this, but beware of using conference calls as the way to stay in contact with the developer and keep up with all these things because as many of you I'm sure know, it takes forever to schedule them. And while they might be good for sort of a group brainstorming when you're trying to come up with ideas, when it comes to actually ironing out the details and making sure that every little thing is getting done, they're fairly ineffective for that. Um, what becomes effective for ironing out details is phone call after phone call after phone call, one-on-one -on -one between you know, the person in-house who's responsible for the, for the project and whoever in the, uh, on the end of the contractor is actually working on that detail. Because, if, because even if you're talking to the project leader and they've, they have, uh, have uh, delegated that responsibility to somebody else on the team, who knows what the line of communication between those two people uh, is. You'll be a lot more effective if you're talking directly to the person on their end who's working on it. We are just about out of time, but we'll just talk about very briefly sure? yeah. about where we, where we, now that we have our site, the contractor, with the exception of the catalog problem, the contractor is out of the picture. It would cost more money to get them to work on anything on the site now. We don't want to do that. So we um, immediately started having two problems. Um, one was they, they had built a quote unquote blog for us using Red Dot. Problem is Red Dot has a separate add-on product uh, that actually adds blogging functionality, and we didn't have that. So it was really a thrown together, uh, it basically it was the, the, the way that you, the, there's, a, there's a huge process, a workflow within Red Dot that you customize, but the workflow involves you know, sending emails and approval from certain people, and, and not only that, but the people who, when you, people are adding blog content, they basically want to type something up in about five minutes save it and it's out there. And even without the approval process, the, the publication cycle with Red Dot is such that what people are editing is not the live site. It gets republished um, as on, on the live server uh, through FTP at, a, at a whatever frequency that you set. And originally we had it set doing it once every 24 hours. Uh, it's now up to every two hours. We did it for one, every one hour at one point, but we had some problems with things not transferring correctly at that frequency. So what happens is that if we did that system, originally people weren't seeing their blog posts show up for uh, up to 24 hours. Uh, now it, it would take a couple of hours. And so we needed something else. The law school also had purchased Community Server and offered that to us for both our blogging and our news uh, system for the library. 
And so we have actually, uh, see, th th this is the website we've been talking about. This is what was built in Red Dot. And we get to show you uh, an internal page there. This is what one of the internal